Kevin M. Cruz, professor of history at Princeton University. I'm here today to talk about the civil rights movement and the common ground. We often memorialize the movement as one that succeeded in breaking down barriers and bringing Americans of all races together at last. But the truth is more complicated than that. Although the two words are commonly conflated, in practice, desegregation did not mean the same thing as integration. While many whites grudgingly went along with court-ordered desegregation across the South, that didn't mean that they were themselves willing to share public spaces with African-Americans. Consider the case of Atlanta, which I studied for my first book. Even in that city, most whites recoiled at the thought of social contact between the races, which they commonly disdained as interracial intimacy. Therefore, all across Atlanta, whenever private neighborhoods and public spaces desegregated, whites quickly abandoned them effectively resegregating those same places almost immediately. As a result of this persistent pattern of white flight, desegregation didn't bring about racial integration in Atlanta or much of the nation, but instead ushered in a new form of racial division. Now in my book, White Flight, I track this phenomenon across a wide variety of places from residential neighborhoods to public schools and private businesses. But in my short time today, I'll just speak briefly about one of these places where the common ground was quickly abandoned. Those are the public parks and recreational spaces of the city. The municipal golf courses represented the first major space desegregated by a federal court order in Atlanta. This came in November of 1955. And what would become a recurring theme of white resistance? Segregationists proposed a drastic response. Rather than let any municipal spaces be integrated, they urged the city to abandon its public parks and public services altogether. Private owners, former Governor Herman Talmadge suggested, could still legally discriminate and could thereby keep these places all white. Indeed, Talmadge predicted the Supreme Court's ruling in Brown versus Board of Education would, quote, probably mean the end of most public golf courses, playgrounds, and things of that type. His successor in office, Governor Marvin Griffin, agreed, I can make the clear declaration that this state will get out of the park business before allowing a breakdown of segregation in the intimacy of the playground, he announced. If he had been in charge, one of the city's golf courses, Griffin said, he would have, quote, plowed them up the next morning and planted alfalfa and corn. However, Governor Griffin was not in charge. Atlanta's more moderate mayor, Bill Hartsfield, was in charge, and he arranged for the quick and peaceful desegregation of the city's golf courses over the Christmas holiday. But that success didn't mean the end of white resistance. Far from it. About seven years later, Additional federal court rulings in 1962 and 1963 called for the rest of Atlanta's public parks and recreational services to be desegregated as well. Again, large numbers of whites fiercely opposed this. More than anything, segregationist whites were outraged that the city's public pools would be desegregated in June of 1963. As police chief Herbert Jenkins remembered, that summer people talked about integration of the swimming pools and little else. Frankly, the police hoped for a rainy summer. There were more agitators driving around trying to see how many Negroes were using our pools than there were people actually swimming in them. Indeed, on the first day of desegregated swimming at Piedmont Park, only a few dozen people actually went into the pool, while a crowd of 250 whites stood outside the fences gawking. To cut down on the number of clashes between white and black teenagers at the pools, the city employed high school coaches to manage the pools that summer and kept a few uniformed cops and plainclothes detectives on hand as well. Aside from a few fist fights, desegregation went calmly. There were no major incidents. In truth, things went smoothly, not because whites accepted the decision, but because they had decided to flee from these desegregated spaces. For many whites, integrated pools represented a level of, quote, interracial intimacy that they simply could not stomach. Indeed, the image of black and white children swimming together in the same pool was so repugnant to most white Southerners that some segregationist organizations sent photographers to Atlanta's pools to get pictures to use in their future propaganda. One man stood outside the Piedmont Park pool and handed out leaflets to everyone entering, which read, quote, the Negro race is a reservoir of venereal infection. Will you expose yourself and your children to this deadly threat? Keep your children out of the public pools. Not surprisingly, white attendance at the pools plummeted that year. Even police chief Jenkins, who had prayed for a rainy summer, was alarmed at the, quote, noticeable drop in attendance. As whites abandoned the pools, they asked the city to follow suit. And in many ways, Atlanta did. The next summer, hours of operation were cut back drastically at most public pools. The change had been made, Mayor Ivan Allen Jr. said, to, quote, lessen racial tension wherever possible. But the city did more than simply reduce the operating hours of its pools. It also reduced their size and their scope. 
Instead of the old system in which these magnificent large pools served broad sections of the city, Atlanta launched a new, quote, neighborhood pool policy, which had smaller, quote, walk to pools enclosed in individual neighborhoods. Given the segregated nature of those neighborhoods, the move was widely seen as a way around the desegregation order. For some whites, however, even these changes in policy were still not enough. They demanded an end to public pools altogether, staging protests and filing petitions from all parts of the city. In Candler Park, for instance, 850 whites signed a petition calling for the closing of their neighborhood pool, which they said had been, quote, a menace to the peace and tranquility of the community ever since it desegregated. When pools such as theirs closed, segregationists delighted in it. In 1966, for instance, a tour bus driver entertained visitors at Grant Park with a joke about some recent changes there. There used to be a swimming pool here, he announced, but when the integrationists forced us to let Negroes in, we fixed them all by filling it in with concrete. It's a bear pit now. According to a reporter, his white passengers thought this was hilarious. Unwilling to share public spaces with African-Americans, white Atlantans once again looked for a private alternative. Now, in the case of public parks, some whites hoped to move municipal lands into private hands, citing, quote, social changes due to the racial situation. The Atlanta Council of Civic Clubs called for the privatization of the entire city park system. Community civic clubs, neighborhood churches, and, quote, patriotic and historical organizations could take ownership of the parks, they suggested, and thereby maintain the racial status quo in them. Ultimately, though, the privatization of the large city park system was simply not feasible. A system of private parks was just too massive, too expensive an undertaking. But the creation of private pools was a realistic alternative to public pools, and soon countless whites rushed to start construction in their own backyards. Indeed, the demand for private pools was so sudden and severe that a number of fly-by-night construction crews cropped up in the city, fleecing desperate customers. Eventually, Atlanta's legitimate pool builders had to form a new organization, the Greater Atlanta Swimming Pool Association, just to clean up their industry's reputation and guard against con artists looking to make a quick buck from white panic. Now, white flight from the parks, pools, and golf courses was bitter because whites had long felt that these public spaces were, quote, theirs and theirs alone. This stemmed largely from the history of segregation. To most whites in Atlanta, such spaces, quote, belonged to them as a racial birthright. But whites' sense of ownership of these public spaces was much deeper than that. As they saw it, whites paid the vast majority, or in some accounts, all of municipal taxes. Only whites, they believed, had paid for these public spaces, so only whites should be allowed to use them. When the city opened these public spaces to Blacks, whites felt that their belongings, their birthright, had quite literally been stolen from them. The perception that whites paid more taxes than Blacks was quite common in Atlanta during the late 1950s and early 1960s. A typical pamphlet from a segregationist organization sought to outrage whites with some wildly inflated numbers. Do you know that Atlanta's population is one-third color, it wrote. They are paying 5% of the taxes, but receive 75% of the tax money for their race. Segregationist groups often tapped into this racial resentment over taxes to rally angry whites. Many of these segregationist organizations called themselves taxpayer organizations or taxpayer leagues or property owners associations. The meaning of these identities were clear in the literature they sent out. One warned, quote, we are faced with a problem of encroachment upon our community by the Negro race. If our community is lost, then who will be the loser except you, the property owner, and the taxpayer? You cannot sit by and let this situation go. You must have the intestinal fortitude to stand up and fight these battles whenever and wherever you can. When public spaces were desegregated, whites presented themselves as victims and once again urged white flight as the response. Common use of recreational facilities supported by taxation now seems inescapable, one complained in 1958, but the diehard segregationists can stay away from contaminated swimming pools and swim at home in peace. Because of their refusal to share these public spaces with blacks, whites essentially made their old complaint come true. Their taxes now were being used to fund services largely enjoyed by African-Americans. Whites refused to acknowledge that this was a result of their own racism and their own choices. Instead, they blamed the city for, quote, stealing these public spaces and surrendering them to Blacks. Increasingly resentful over the course of racial change, these whites rebelled. In the early 1960s, when Atlanta's political and business elites proposed a new slate of civic improvements, ordinary whites decided to finally draw the line. These new spaces, they reasoned, would be desegregated as well, and therefore whites would never use them. So why should whites fund them? 
The growing white backlash on issues of race and public space became clear in the battles over two bond initiatives in 1962 and 1963. The first bond initiative called for $80 million for a number of improvements on schools, streets, sewers, and other public works, as well as two proposals for a new civic auditorium and a new cultural center at Piedmont Park. Angry over the loss of their old public spaces, whites refused to pay for two more spaces that they believed would be used only by African-Americans. The mayor had presented the auditorium as a way for the city to attract national conventions and hold large events, but many whites saw it as another space that would be used exclusively by blacks. An incredibly racist cartoon circulated by the Ku Klux Klan, for instance, depicted a black leader who was labeled in the cartoon as Martin Luther Kuhn, addressing an integrated audience and bragging that the mayor was going to, quote, raise the bond taxes and build us a new auditorium to use for future NAACP meetings. Not surprisingly, the bond went down to a stunning defeat. As the Atlanta Journal noted, nearly 58,000 people turned out at the polls, which they said was, quote, a record number as far as bond referenda go. Basic improvements in schools and street works lost narrowly, but the plans for an auditorium and cultural center died in what a stunned reporter called a smothering defeat. The cultural center proposal, for instance, was rejected by a margin of almost two to one, with the vast majority of opposition coming from working class and middle class white neighborhoods. Whites made their reason for rejecting the bond proposals quite clear. As one man complained, the tax burden for the projects would rest on, quote, 90% of the white people while African-Americans would get all the benefits. So it simply wasn't in the interest of whites to support it. Others agreed. I think this is another step, one white man said, where the taxpayers are tired of paying hard-earned money for things that they will not be able to enjoy because of the prospect of forced integration, which means that the facilities would be used almost entirely by Negroes. Now that desegregation had come to Atlanta, he continued, the white people who pay all the bills have decided to stick a little closer together and vote accordingly. The mayor tried again in the next year, 1963, introducing a second bond referendum pared down to what he called the bare essentials. Although most of the controversial aspects from the year before had been excluded, the racial politics only became more pronounced. A routine letter from the mayor to the local NAACP, for instance, was doctored to look like the mayor was taking orders from the civil rights group. Copies appeared across the city with a warning at the bottom, quote, don't give the captive mayor of the minority block a blank check to use against voters and taxpayers of Atlanta, he warned. Vote against bonds. Allen responded with a massive public relations campaign and a huge get out the vote effort. Only then did the bond pass by a very narrow margin. Even then, analysts were stunned at the resistance and resentment in the white community. The negative vote came from sections of the city and county where white segregationist sentiment traditionally is the strongest, a report after the election noted. And the vote went heaviest, they said, against projects where integration or benefits for Negroes might have appeared to be involved, urban renewal, parks, libraries, the auditorium. But as Atlanta's story of desegregation demonstrated over and over again, for many whites, improvements on public spaces and, quote, benefits for Negroes had come to mean the same thing. As I've argued in my larger work and try to suggest here, it's important that we remember white flight was about much more than the physical relocation of whites, as massive as those numbers were. It was more than a physical relocation, a political revolution, one in which the old understandings of the city as a place in which its citizens shared public spaces and shared a general concept of community was replaced by a new scheme in which individuals were treated to private spaces, both personally and politically. White flight in the end was not just a retreat from integrated public space, but all public space. And that's a legacy that Atlanta and much of America still wrestles with today.